Hello guys, a very good evening. So I think we can start now. Well, uh, let's uh, begin. Let me share my screen. So guys here, what we're going to do is to talk about, once again, uh, the machine learning technique that we have. Well, uh, this series has been up for, for a pretty long time now. We have done a lot of series in different types of uh, machine learning techniques. And we have been talking about other techniques like regression neural networks. So today what we're going to talk about is largely what we know as decision trees. So that is what we are going to do. Well, let's begin uh, the webinar. So I formally welcome all of you. And let's start off uh, with the webinar now. So see here the agenda that would be to talk about largely what is machine learning and then talk about decision tree, then talk about applications of decision trees and the demo through the decision trees that we have. So that is something that uh, we'll do. If uh, Just give me a minute for a while. I'll just resume. So guys, let's be back. So what we're going to talk about today is about the decision trees. And here what we're going to talk about the machine learning overview, the introduction to decision trees, the applications of decision trees, and some demos uh, using one of the leading SaaS tools that we have for machine learning. And we are also going to talk about SAS and NMIS Global Access School for Continuing Education, uh, that would be NGACE. And uh, once you've done that, you know, uh, we'll have this session open for any question answers. Meanwhile, you got your chat windows. So as and when you feel like having any query and you want to raise it, please mark it to everyone so that everyone can see what the question is being asked. Nevertheless, I'll also repeat uh, the question before I answer it. So machine learning, as we all know, and we have been seeing in the past series as well, it's a branch of AI. And the whole idea is to generate systems or methods which can do either the prediction or the patterns without less of human intervention. And the whole idea of such an application would be to help. Let's say if it is business analytics, the idea would be to make better business decisions using the technology and the data set available. So more and more dependencies on machine. And wherein what we'll see is that, or we also, I think, know that uh, machine learning would be, you know, wherein the algorithms are such that they learn from the past data, and they're able to either predict the future or identified patterns, which anyways or otherwise would be very difficult for a human mind to comprehend. And then ultimately, the entire system or the thing is designed to make better business decisions that we have. So well, moving on with this very workable definition. So machine learning is just lying at an intersection of data mining and AI. And largely in the business world, if you would see, there are primarily two main usages for that. One is prediction, other, other is the pattern recognition. So other names to it are supervised and unsupervised kind of machine learning. So SAS has been pioneer in developing machine learning algorithm. In fact, uh, one of the first machine learning algorithms was developed by SAS CEO Jim Goodnight almost 30 years ago. It was something called as K nearest neighbor. It has its own usages. Now, when it comes to uh, technology providers like SAS, the whole idea of the machine learning concept is to provide a system that can give or provide faster results. So key things that you would see in SaaS products is the automation part of machine learning, wherein most of the things in the algorithms are pre-written, though of course you can customize them or write your own, but that's the benefit. 
So if I'm a business user, I just want a plug and play tool. That's where the SaaS would have automated a lot of things. On top of this, the customization options are also there. And at the same time, the speed is what of prime importance today. So any kind of analysis or the overall response time should be fast enough. And that is what SaaS is known for. Machine learning has been or can be classified as supervised and unsupervised. Supervised where you have something to predict. You have, as statisticians would say, a dependent variable or a target variable. Unsupervised is largely simply finding out patterns in the data. So a lot of these algorithms exist starting from clustering to SVD to SOM to PCS. These are different, different techniques that has been developed over a period of time. Likewise, in supervised learning, we have been discussing about decision trees, regression, neural networks, SVM, and many of these items uh, that we see. So what we are talking nowadays is how to generate and get the benefit, the best benefit out of uh, the techniques that we have and the technology that we have. Nevertheless, the combo also exists for supervised and the semi-supervised methods, which can do prediction and classification at the same time, including clustering. So there are other algorithms available. So these are some of you know the ways to classify. Nevertheless, there are newer methods of classification like reinforcement learning, development, and so many of them. Uh, but largely, the main three are supervised, unsupervised, and semi-supervised. We're also going to talk about that why machine learning has become important. So just to understand why it has become so important nowadays, the first is the data and its availability, and this field itself is growing, and it's a separate area where one can look for, let's say, career opportunities or developing some applications there which can handle, store, access big volumes of the data. As we say, we live in the age of internet, and given that IoT is there, so this is a big field. The second is, obviously, when you have to have those fast-running computers and machines to aid in your business, you need faster computing power. So that's the second area which is developing. And the third, obviously, is the area which, wherein either you can be one of the algorithm writers or you are simply the users of algorithm to get the best out of your machine learning initiative. Well, when it comes to SaaS, you see SaaS can provide all three. So SaaS has abilities to give you faster data access, and it is one of key things in any efficient machine learning modeling, or it's a fundamental to any of these applications of machine learning. The data can come in any shape. It could be structured data, like the data you collect through your ERPs, or it could be online, digital, social media, or it could be a device-generated data, maybe the sensors or the mobile phones. So data has its own sources and its own area. And uh, what uh, we say at SAS is that you can access any kind of data or any type of data. The second obviously comes the machine learning part of it, wherein the discovery lies. So maybe you're looking for some kind of patterns or maybe you want to predict something. Machine learning is the place where you can deploy either predefined algorithms or your new algorithms and that would lead to a lot of applications which might include prediction, optimization and many others. The third obviously, Whatever you do in machine learning, the results needs to be working on the ground, and that's what the deployment would be. Now, the results might go to a mobile device or a CM or a call center. So any of this thing which connects a non-technical guy with the customer and with the help of machine learning is able to make better decisions, that's where the deployment would be called successful. And that is one of the prime areas. Basically, it's the end product. And if deployment is correct, then there is a win or the advantage that you're looking out of uh, machine learning. Now, the process flow of the machine learning would obviously be the same. We have been discussing this, like the access data needs to be accessed and pre-processed. You need to prepare the data. Modifications would happen. That area is generally referred as feature engineering. And then you have to deploy a learning algorithm onto it. So algorithms that we have discussed already, like neural network or regression. And today we are going to discuss the CN3 happens to be one of the learning algorithms that can learn from the past data and can provide something that would be able to predict. But before we go ahead, we'll also see that we have to evaluate how good or bad is the algorithm based on some kind of validation data or test data, and the best model is picked up 
for applications of future classifications or predictions that we might have to do on to the incoming new data. And then any kind of post-process analysis can be carried upon. So that's the typical process, which we call machine learning process in any of the applications of machine learning. And coming to the applications, you see the machine learning, including the decision tree that we're gonna to discuss today has a lot of its application, be it credit scoring, or the NBOs that you might be aware in banking or in retail, then comes the fraud. Many of the Indian companies are doing the same way. A lot of banks in India, the leading banks, their credit scoring applications are now running on machine learning principles. Then you have the NBOs that many banks nowadays, when you get offer from a bank, that this would be ready as pre-approved something for you. Maybe there is an algorithm who is deciding for it. Similarly, for fraud detection, whether it is a government fraud or a fraud in an organization or a stock market fraud, a lot of applications. Similarly, coming to the marketing side of it, whether you want to segment your customers or you want to generate online recommendations the way Amazon flip cards of the world would have it. One way or the other, there is a machine learning algorithm running behind the scenes. Apart from that, there are other applications in corporates like you know customer attrition or employee attrition or target acquisition activities. A lot of predictions are required there, and that's what the machine learning algorithm is going to provide. Then new areas that are happening nowadays is to place the ads real time, wherein let's say you are moving in front of a McDonald's on a busy day, and suddenly you get start getting the information about uh, certain discounts in a restaurant or let's say the McDonald's. So that's something on the real time ad placement. So there's a lot of data systems have to come together. A lot of algorithms have to work together to generate a system like that. It could be cybersecurity, it could be in manufacturing where you talk about your predictive asset maintenance, wherein you just want to predict when the machine component would wear out and you would be able to provide the necessary prevention or preventive maintenance so as to avoid costlier shutdowns or costlier machine failures. Similarly, on the tech side of it, be it sentiment analysis, analyzing social media data, many of those applications are now based on these machine learning. So we see that the applications are pervasive and knowingly or unknowingly it is touching our lives. So such is the importance of uh, machine learning. Now having said that, the machine learning needs to be learned. So here one, uh, you need a technology or a tool which can do a lot of those calculations that underway or undergo in any machine learning algorithm and also a tool that can provide a systematic approach to everything. So what I'm gonna introduce and the demos would run onto the same thing, you need either enterprise minor or text minor, wherein what you will realize that it's an easy to use interface, you've got a UI over there, you can do things like data preparation, feature engineering, you could, you could deploy NLP, it could be used also for finding out the best models, basically the entire model lifecycle management, including other activities like or production scoring and integration with open source for certain specific modules that you can do that. There are also industry specific modules provided in this tool. So what we'll first discuss is today's topic that is the C entries and what they are and how they work and then finally what are the industrial applications for the same and then we'll move on to the demos. So first of all let's try to understand what a decision tree is. See the name gets derived tree from the general sense of a tree. However, uh, on pen and paper, if I have to draw, it would be something like, let's say, a picture that appears on the right of the slide, wherein, you know, you see, I have some data. In the data, I have some, let's say, blue balls and red squares, or some two different shapes, and let's say I want to create a classification algorithm. Now, this is a very simplified example where in two dimensions that you can see that X1 and X2 are two variables. Let's say that X1 is income, X2 is age, and C1, C2 are persons over there with certain specific characteristics. So if I were to identify the algorithm, what it would do is it would find out cutoffs on X1 and X2, which tends to separate out one group from the other. So see, first rule that is written is X1 greater than W10. That kind of was the red line, vertical line that you see. It separates some of the blues and reds into two different areas. And then the second rule that is green horizontal line, wherein the rule is written as X2 greater than some value W20. Now, if I have these two rules, I'll be able to identify a red square from a blue box. 
So such kind of uh, method or the philosophy is what behind the decision tree. And the whole premise of running the decision tree is to find out these set of rules, which can identify one category from the other. Now, in the real life, uh, the problem is not going to be two dimensional or as easy as what this illustration is, but the idea works this way. Could be extended to any n number of dimensions, and the software are there for, to do any kind of computations we require. So that's the essence of a decision tree. So what we're going to see is trees like this. So the starting point is called the root. Imagine this thing as if it is an inverted tree. The root is at the top. Then you have branches going on, and each of those branches are called nodes. And the branches which further do not get split up is called the leaf or the terminal nodes. So any name can be given to that. And you, all you need is to create this tree, an algorithm, and the data, wherein you have ABC columns, which impact a target column called Z. So these are all indicative names. For example, in a banking situation, the Z variable or the target variable could have any name, be the defaulter and the non-defaulter. Whereas, let's say for a loan, and there are a lot of variables which are going to impact this default behavior, like the age, income, wealth, previous loans, other behavioral characteristics, financial parameters, demographic variables. So the choice of the variables would be anything that represents ABC. Now, what the decision tree is going to do is to just, you know, give you the set of rules which maximizes the separation of a zero and a one. And those rules can be easily read in plain simple English. And one can also generate a SQL code out of it if you wish to. But that's the essence of a decision tree, how it would look like or what might be the basics behind it. This kind of looks the same way. Also, I'm getting some of the queries. So let me just go through one of the questions I got was, uh, the question goes like this. Machine learning isn't a single entity itself. It's a part of it, artificial intelligence. So you're right. See, in this world, one way to look at it, everything is connected with everything. But in, still, if I were to say, machine learning is not a single entity. It is one of the parts of sciences that is offshoot of mixture of many previous sciences that has merged into it. So statistics, data mining, mathematics, computer science, data technologies, all coming together to call something as machine learning. But that machine learning itself belongs to a large area called artificial intelligence, which could be used for robotics and many, many other areas that might be used. One of the usages is machine learning, or one of the subsets of AI might be machine learning, where I use that. So it's so you're right, as you've said, it's not a single entity, but it's a subset of so many other areas and the techniques that exist. Okay, so let's get back, and we were talking about the scene trees. So the, here is yet another example wherein what we want to showcase is a tree. And again, these trees are simple to understand. Let's say if a smoker, yes or no, then let's say age less than 30, then there is a lesser health risk. But if the age is more than 30, let's say there's more risk than based on the diet. If your diet is poor, then you are at more risk. Whereas if the diet is good, then the risk is low. So any kind of a depiction that might happen the way you are seeing right now on your screens, is what the essence of uh, the decision tree. Now, a lot of calculations go into find out the variables which might classify one variable from the other, these cutoffs of age 30 or 40, there is a calculation logic. So all those algorithms are generally created and written most of the time by either academicians or the scientists, and then they are available for a business user or a data scientist to be used. In fact, more and more new algorithms are getting developed and one can add more to it if you are on the research side of the algorithm. So if I were to just sum up, or let's say, you know, put it in more structured manner. So first of all, a decision tree would refer to a tree structure of rules. Those rules could be called as classification rules or association rules. And the whole idea of decision tree modeling or decision tree machine learning would be collecting those variables first, which you think has an impact on your target variable or the outcome variable that you have. So let's say you want to say good or bad. So on what characteristics the good and bad depicts, you have to find out and then you have to have sufficiently 
the available data so that the algorithms can learn itself how to classify. Now, the best part is in the decision tree, once you give the data to machines nowadays, they can identify what variables are most important, what variables are least important, what variables would be ultimately used. And the best part of a decision tree algorithm, if you have attended neural network, you would have realized that in neural network, the kind of equations that get created is very, very complex. Decision tree, on the other hand, is very simple. All it gives you is simply the rules that you would use in your business and you simply deploy and start getting your predictions or classifications depending on the objective that you have. Coming to the applications, so you see these applications are so large that if I were to pinpoint, I would need probably a day to you know, just count them. But then what we have done is largely we have, we have two kinds of applications of DC entry. It's either prediction or classification. The areas could be business management, your customer relationship management, finding out good customer, bad customer, or let's say propensity to buy or propensity modeling. It could be for fraud detection. It could be used in engineering or for finding out patterns in energy consumption. It could be fault diagnosis in a manufacturing study or healthcare. Also, it could be used. A lot of applications exist in agriculture. So there are very, very broad areas wherein such kind of applications could be used. A single search, if you were to see, you can simply write very, very specific search and still you will get a lot of work. For example, you want to see the C entry algorithm in telecom industry, how the telecom industry is using it. Just simply do a Google search and you can see how much of an application such kind of an algorithm would have in each industry. So put your industry of choice, just put some simple keywords on the Google. And what you're going to see is a lot of applications popping up for the technique called as the C entry. So, so to say, it's almost every industry and every walk would have deployed decision trees in one way or the other if they are on, on to machine learning. Now, these tools are pretty much popular and probably more popular than neural networks because they're simple to understand and interpret. The tree-like structure makes it easy to explain to anybody what's happening in the algorithm. It can handle any kind of data, whether numerical or categorical data. In fact, the data preparation required is also less. It doesn't assume most of uh, uh, the data to be normal, and it is pretty much robust to the outlier. And we don't call it a black box model the way we were calling a neural network. So it's everything is open, and we can interpret and analyze. So these are some of the benefits. And even these algorithms, and given the state of technology today, any type of data set or any size of data set can be easily used with that. So, and they're less computing, you know, computer intensive as compared to, let's say, the neural networks we saw the last time. So there are definitely several advantages, and that's the reason you would see that any analytics team that you talk about, whether India or abroad, they would have used this technique for sure in one problem or the other. And it's a very commonplace technique if you were to discuss with somebody who is from the analytics background. And you can check this out. Well, so how does this entire thing works? So what I'm going to do is to spend some time on some kind of you know, illustrations over the slides. And then I'm going to go to give you a demo. We might take a couple of case studies to begin with. And we'll see how these things can be deployed for a given business problem. So first of all, what it does is, unlike neural network or regression where you have equations, here you've got some rules. You have shortly see what do we mean by these rules and how does those rules look like. So typically, let's say this is your business problem. Let's say you have X1 and X2. Maybe age your income and then you have customers which are default or non-default or good or bad. So here I've just used some different colors to indicate that. So a typical decision tree output would look like this. It will give you a tool. And all you need to do is to you know, look for the areas. For example, if it is X2, you might have to look for less than 0.63 or more than 0.63. And then within that area, you might have to look for X1. And the system will tell you what are the chances that the given point at that, let's say you do not know the color. This is a future prediction problem. Depending on this tree, it can lead you to a conclusion that if, what is the probability that if it is a yellow kind of a leaf or let's say a blue kind of a leaf, so which is in business terms could be good, bad, default or non-default or buyer, non-buyer, any two categories that is of your interest in business. 
so that's how the rules would work so these are simply the cutoffs over a range of a given variable like 0.63 and 0.52 and 0.51 and these cutoffs are nothing but the work of the algorithms that run behind the scenes and they give us the most optimal cutoffs that i should use for my rules so that way you can predict for example here we just predicted that a point which would lie in such a region has 70 percent chance of being a yellow and since the chances more than 50 percent we would classify it as a yellow point so putting it in business terms could be x1 is income x2 is age and you are saying if a person is beyond a certain income or below a certain age then the characteristics would be like this so that's how the tree is going to work now in the real business problems you know those those trees are pretty long these are not the way i am showing it here the whole idea of these simple slides is to bring home the concept now the question comes uh, okay we have predicted it 7 and yellow 0.7% in yellow how does the system knows the cutoffs that's where the things are slightly complex but if you are a student of statistics you would know what a classification matrix is so what the system does is it finds out something called as log worth of a variable so it would do splits like it when you draw a vertical line somewhere on this graph you have a left hand side and a right hand side and let's say at one of the points the differences are maximized which means the difference is for right now if the line was the vertical line were not to distinguish anything all the entries in the table on the left hand side would all be 50 50 50 50 everywhere but since now some differentiation has been achieved and the yellow marks that you see uh, sorry the white tied or white marks that you see on the side these are all the log worth values that you get so let's say for a given variable x1 the maximum point or the maximum log worth achieved was 0.95 now this log worth is nothing but the log of the p value of for the chi square of the left hand table that you have now here i won't go into the details of chi square or how does it gets calculated or what it is that is something we take generally when the sessions are longer but that's the concept here that is involved so it is based on some number and log worth is a measure of differentiation power of x1 at a given point so let's say the maximum differentiation power we got 0.95 for x1 at 0.52 as you can see in the vertical line the process is repeated for the next variable that happens to be x1 and let's say here the log worth was 4.92 and it happened so happened at 0.63 so the software will keep track of all these cutoffs and all these log worth and the maximum log worth point is picked up for the split and that's how your first split occurs which means you are from node you get two new leaves or nodes and the tree starts to grow so that is your first search for 0.63 and the resultant is that x2 gets split into two nodes the process is repeated again and again on the remaining portions maximum log worths are found out the point of maximum log worth and the given variable for a given variable becomes the split point and your tree keeps on growing so you can stop the tree at a point that is most of the softwares allow you to stop at a certain point at a reasonable degree when you have generated enough rules and this is gets repeated till you say that you have achieved a maximal tree which is like the set of rules or the depth of the tree that you want to achieve and that's how all your rules will get generated now this algorithm since it's based on chi square it is also known as cart chi square automatic sorry chaid chi square automatic interaction detection then there are other algorithms also so many of them uh, you can simply you know google them out for more interest or else you know you can attend a course on the c entry analysis wherein you would get more insights on to this now that is what we call a split search and in any machine learning tool we i think we've discussed it in the earlier webinars also remember this when you make a model you need to verify it or validate it so what you do is generally you you split the data into training and validation that's your past data for validation you already know the actual values but you will make your set of algorithms of the trees to predict for you and then you will compare different types of trees on the validation so how a typical algorithm would work in such a situation would be uh, or let's say at least this how it works in e minor first it creates a very very large tree we call it maximal tree on the training data 
then we take the rules to the validation data and find out how good it is then we successfully prune it which means make it simpler shed some of the leaves see in how many possible ways it can be done find out which one of the trees is best in the validation data which means which gives you more accuracy take that one further simplify in all the possible combinations then again evaluate which tree is the best keep the best one go to the stage till you know only root node is left when you have done all the, the software will record all these steps and you would have the ratings for each of the models coming in and the rule that we follow is choose the simplest model with the highest validation assessment now all these things are automated in the software we are going kind of slow here and in steps just to understand what happens inside a machine learning software when it is trying to find out which tree is the best for you so it will leave no stone unturned or no variable unconsidered till the time it finds out the best split or the max log worth and then the final tree is run and then that's how it will execute and find out the best model or the best algorithm for you to predict now i got one of the questions like which software will it do see there are a lot of softwares if i were to talk about there are softwares from sas the one that we are going to see is sas enterprise miner then you have many others like ml azure angos vika softwares from r python altrix oracle miner so i think if i were to name it there will be 30 plus different kinds of software available out in the market which can provide such kind of uh, methods and they all come with different different techniques as well so this entry is the topic for the day so that is what we will focus and we also need to understand once you are predicting and once you have actual values how do you ascertain which model is the best or which model is better so you need to understand some of the assessment criteria so for example for binary targets when you have to just simply classify things as 1 and 0 we call that as decision sometimes you might have to rank or sometimes you just want only estimates so we have three kinds of predictions coming out which we call decisions rankings and estimates typically a decision is all about when one getting predicted as one or a zero getting predicted as zero let's say one is fraud that is my interest for category or it could be a buyer or it could be a employee which is going to retain or a customer who is going to be retained so you code your data yourself and decide what category of your interest is and code it as one let the software predict and then you match what the software is predicting and what your actual values were now if these values were close enough we would say that the tree or any algorithm is good or bad so for decisions we might use if misclassification which is a count of wrong predictions so false positive or false negative as we call them so any of those trees which is going to minimize my misclassification rate is is best for me or the reverse of it is called you know accuracy so one minus misclassification becomes accuracy so that could have been also be used for rankings we use concordance typically category 1 should get a higher rank and a zero should get low all those pairs where it is happening we call it concordance and the reverse is called discordance so i should be looking for the models which gives me the best concordance or it could be simply estimates you want to maybe predict sales and you are getting some values you just want to see how much of a difference in the prediction and the actual value is we generally take a square of it to avoid negatives and anything that minimizes this quantity which is called error that is target minus estimate the tree which is going to give me the least of it becomes the best for me so these are some of the measures like for decisions kind of stuff we use accuracy and misclassification for ranking we use concordance discordance for estimates if your predicted predicted variable is continuous we used something called as squared error now software provide all these calculations for you and you they also suggest which model is the best so what we are going to do is let's take some quick demos for the problem so here we have some business problem so let's say uh there is a big retail store out there which is across many continents and there is a company which wants to sell organic products but before they go full fledged they just want to do a pilot test and they have done that and the data is collected and the whole idea is to find out can this data tell them what kind of customers buy organic products more 
and based on the profiles or the rules they have to take a decision like who should be used for advertising to sell the products a senior matured guy or a young model so just you know as an indication of age or can the software tell me what pointed segments the company should target first or the other way of saying it who are the potential customer so we'll take on an example like this and we see how the tool looks like and how does it predicts and how it can be further used so we we'll do a demo on this organic product buying behavior so here what i'm going to do is to take you to the tool that we have so here we have the data now this tool can be used this is called saas enterprise miner it has its own algorithms available which goes in this tool palette called sample explore modify model assess it has lot of algorithms under this modeling belt so if i were to show you it has all the facilities for auto neural decision tree dmine regression dm neural ensemble gradient boosting least tangle regression memory based reasoning and lot of these techniques are there these are all machine learning techniques apart from that you have random forest support vector machine so lot of other techniques are also available my objective is that the process i've already drawn so my data was organics data so i'll give you the glimpse of a data how does it looks like uh, the starting point of the data so the data is what we have is this is the retail data that was there you see my target is who bought the product or not this is just a pilot test we have done on 22000 customers so this are 22000 rows in my data so you have the purchase indicator that is 1 or 0 so you put the product on the shelves ask your loyal customers to see those products feel those products and if they buy the sale this indicator is 1 otherwise no sales is 0 and we have since they are all loyal customers from the database we know the age of the customer where he lives what's the gender of the customer which geography region belongs to what kind of a loyalty status whether it is a gold customer or a tin or a platinum kind of a customer so these are all different different variables so we have information on their incomes also called affluence grade so all these are called input variables and my target variable is organic purchase indicator my intention is to build a model so that i can develop an understanding on to this data and later on if new customers were there or let's say this is only 22000 customer i might have a subscriber base of 1 million i would run the algorithm on to the rest of the customer and the system will tell who is going to buy or who is not going to buy typically this is what propensity modeling would mean to figure out which customer would buy the product or not without doing any other thing so you just use a small sample of customers to do your pilot test let the machine learn for you and let it predict now what we have done in this process is these processes are created by dragging only so see no coding required so my data is available here for example for my data sources i can drag this i want to divide my data into let's say the partitions i want to do one set of data or piece of data i want to keep it for making models other i want to keep it as validation so this way by dragging and connecting appropriate nodes or algorithms i have developed this entire flow chart so i started with organics data i partitioned it i transformed certain variables there were some missing values i imputed then of course in this diagram you can see a regression algorithm or a neural network has been done my interest is on to the decision tree so when a decision tree runs i would show you how the results would look like so there are a lot of reports that would come for model comparison several kinds of statistics that might come one of the statistics is to see what is the misclassification rate which i can see it from here so the best tree that was given to me has a misclassification rate of 18% which means uh, this tree has only misclassification rate of 18% the other way of putting it is it has 78% accuracy i want to see what rules govern and what rules for my customers would work so there is something called as node rules so you get rule number 16 19 and all that these are called node numbers and it, these rules are very simple it says if gender is either female and the age is less than 44.5 and the affluence grade is 6.5% the chance that your product would be bought is only 34% so likewise these are large set of rules that i can see or else if i am not interested in these english rules this is the rule uh, this is the tree diagram that i get and i can check that in the pilot study only 24% bought the product 75% did not age comes out to be a important variable here 
And if I were to see the behavior of the people of age, the system finds out the cutoff is 44.5. If you are targeting customers who are young, or at least who are less than of 44.5 years of age, the chances of selling the product is as high as 52%. If the age were to be more than 44.5, there is only 15% chance of selling it. So that way, you can go down and find out rules where your chances of selling the products get maximized. So there will be certain islands where you will see very high chance of selling the product. For example, let us look at this node number 23, which says that, or let's say here, the chance of selling is around 84%, which means if you are of age less than 44.5, if you have gender is female and your affluence grade is more than 11.5, the chances of selling it is 84%. So that way you can analyze what segments you should be targeting, what segments you should be avoiding. Somewhere your chances of selling will be less, somewhere your chances of selling will be more. So each node is nothing but your customer and the rule tells you what segment, how to reach that segment and that's how you can maximize your you know, sales or the profit and all that. So that's how. So if I were to you know, answer this company that who you should be selling, the best, I would say that, you know, just first try selling it to the people less than of 44.8, then with affluence grade of 9.5, because there the chances of selling is 69%, as opposed to the previous, without any modeling, the data told only 24% chance of selling. And if within gender, if it is female, then your chances are further high to 77%. And within that too, if the affluence grade was to increase to 11.5, the chance of selling the product is as high as 85%. So I know what are my potential segments now. For example, this is a very healthy segment to target because it has 85% chance of sales happening, as opposed to the previous one where the chance was only, uh, let's say, 24% to begin with. So that's where you jack up, you have lifts in your business, and you now know whom to sell and whom not to sell. Apart from that, it can also predict individual probabilities. So what I've done is later on I've done the model comparison and the scoring node, that is what is called deployment of the tool. So let's say the new data has come, which has some kind of organic buyer. So here what you see is that this data would be your rest of the customer, the one million customer I was talking about, and you want to see who would buy or who would not buy. So if you were to browse this data, it has everything else, but not that target is not available. And if I were to predict for these customers, all I have to do is to bring in and put up a scoring node with an appropriate model. And what the scoring node does is, and that's the meaning of scoring, is to predict where the customer behavior was unknown, whether they will buy or not. These are customers who are in my database, never exposed to the pilot study, but I got the rules from the pilot study, and I'm applying the rules on the pilot study. And whosoever, now it, it has a variable called into target, wherever the chance is the customer who will buy the product is one. So I would go to the, all the customers where the prediction is that customer is gonna buy, and that way my advertising, my offers, will be far more fine-tuned, and these are the persons who would eventually buy my product. So I can identify a buyer from a non-buyer on any larger database now, just making a model on a smaller set of data, and then learning from there, and then scoring a large data set, and that will give me the buyer worthy non-buyers. Now this tool needs to be mastered. You need a practice on the tool and you need to do more case studies if you want to use that tool, but it is really easy. It's all done up and all you need is a little theory on the algorithms that are being used and the logic behind it. Once you are done with that, you are just developing machine learning applications for the business. So that's how it works. In fact, I'll just take a one more quick example. Uh, as a part of a demo. So what I'm going to introduce is, you know, uh, a case for Ted Kaczynski. Now this guy, you can lot of read a lot of things on Wikipedia about him. So this chap, called Ted Kaczynski, obviously is in jail now. He has a lot of problems. But uh, if you were to read the entire Wikipedia page, he was one of the youngest to enter Harvard, youngest to become one of the PhD is in mathematics in US and he was the youngest professor. He was assistant professor at the age of 23 in the University at Berkeley. So he done a lot of good things. 
But at the same time, uh, he was a new Luddite in the sense he had a feeling that technology around the world, the way the expansions are happening, concretization of cities and nations is happening, we are going away from the nature and the technology is destroying the real comfort in human life. So he started writing to many people saying that let's stop this rapid development, let's do something good, let's be close to the nature, but nobody kind of listened to him. And then he started bombing all those people. So he would send a bomb and he would set a written letter, but that was typewritten, not his handwriting. He would type and then he would send it and all the letters from the bombing sites were recovered because they were sent differently. And later on, FBI was after this case, there were 35 bombings, 30 people injured, 3 people dead over a series of period. So this guy has to be caught, but there was no proof. All they had was the written words of him. So here also you see the machine learning can help or maybe we can deploy a decision tree or any other thing. So how does machine learning can help in this area which is called forensic linguistics. So what I'm going to do is to quickly you know just give you a glimpse of the same thing that, that, that was done. So here I'm going to go to just show you a project and I'll just show you that what was the input data and what was the outcome of such a machine learning application onto this forensic linguistic study and from there we can see and appreciate what exactly happened. So what I'm going to show you is, you know, one of the other diagrams in SAS Enterprise Minor. Now this tool, as I would have introduced and said, this is the flagship product of SAS and it is being deployed in many, many industries. So let me just show you the case of Ted Kizelski, how does, how it can be tackled. Of course, it's a demo onto the data uh, that was there. So let the diagram pop up in a while and what we are going to refer to is to this diagram. So my starting point, see the data that we have is all the past literary works of Ted Kaczynski along with several other authors. So you have these essays. Now these essays are really long. They look small here. But they're hidden. So they're like 2,000 to 3,000 words. Then the authorship is already known. Remember that Ted Kaczynski also was an avid writer. He has done a lot of research work. So his writings were available. And then there are six other authors which has been coded as TK or CD or AM. So some name has been given. Our guy is TK. So we have some 2000 essays or so like this from the past. That would be used to train our machine learning algorithm. Of course, here since we are using text mining, so we are going to use, first of all, the partition. We're going to use the NLP in text parsing algorithm. All these algorithms are available here in the text mining. So we are going to use the filter, cluster, topic. Now there is a sequence and there is a reason and a logic of each node here, which is part of text mining analytics that is done. But I'm just going to focus on the decision tree which we are using here. So all these nodes from text parsing to text topic, what they do is they create numbers out of text. Those are called vectors in term document matrix. Those vectors are the mathematics, they carry a lot of information. See, you can create vectors for anything. Like a picture that you see on your mobile phone is nothing but a mathematical vector. Each point on the picture is a pixel. Pixel has an RGB value and it has a coordinate on XYZ. A video is nothing but one more thing, time added to it. And when you see more than 16 pictures per second or so, it, it looks like a video. So whether it is text, whether it is audio, like my voice is also nothing but some mathematical vector that you're listening across the computer. In computer, they're all stored as some vectors or numbers only. So the, the, the literary writing work will get converted into numbers. Now human beings also can identify based on text who is the writer. So if you were to read Mahatma Gandhi's work and Hitler's work, after reading some of the works, you will have a mental image what a new article might belong to. If it is more about violence and wars, then it is Hitler. Otherwise, it becomes Gandhi. So some kind of a logical understanding is there. So systems also, they tend, and these machine learning algorithms can also, via mathematical vectors, can learn the behavior and can capture that information. What we are going to do is in the forensic linguistic. See, that was my articles in the data. That's my new data called forensic score. Here, if I were to show you the data, these were the assets that were recovered on the bombing sites. So what we have is only the essay. See here, there is no information on the author. So we don't know who has written them. 
But since we have trained the model on some of the six suspects that we have, the scoring node or the machine learning algorithm when applied to this data would eventually throw up and predict for me. So we are using a decision tree logic here or the algorithm to predict who is the author of those 11 essays I just showed you, where the authorship was not known. If I were to see the results here, if I'm going to you know, browse that, you see a lot of those texts would get converted into mathematical vectors. You see a lot of numbers and numbers. Now, these numbers might be of interest to a mathematician or a statistician who might want to understand, interpret, and that is what we do typically in these courses that we teach. However, here, one of the things that you might want to see is that the prediction of the author is TK everywhere. So the system can predict that the essays were written by uh, that Ted Kaczynski. So that's how the story goes. But here, once you know this, uh, using text analytics, this guy was, the authorship was known. In the quote, uh, this machine learning couldn't be used as a criteria. So the people went to him, the guys who were doing, the FBA guys who were doing all this, they showed to him that, you see, we have a mathematical procedure that can detect your authorship. And remember, this guy was a genius mathematician. He was very happy at the mathematical work behind it. And he then agreed that, okay, it, it was he who was all doing it. So that's how he's in jail now. So remember, he was a professor and the thinking of interest and passion towards study ultimately you know, uh, made him agree to the point that he is the culprit. So that is one of the applications that you know we can see. So likewise, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples and applications of will that we can talk about. So that was the demo on Ted Kaczynski. So what we'll do is we'll, I'll now spend a little time before I start taking up questions on how you can learn more about such techniques, the entire machine learning with a lot of other techniques, applications, and case study. So SAS has tied, tied up with NMMIS for a very long time. And in fact, as we came in, NMMIS is a name pretty much known in Mumbai. SAS also is the market leader when it comes to analytics far ahead of any other competitor, be it IBM, Microsoft, Azure, or you put any name, it is one of the market market leader with a very large margin. Uh, worldwide, we have 30% market share, whereas in India, it's around 60%, so we are the leaders. And with NMMIS, since it is one of the best educational institutes to be in Mumbai, we are tied up with them in 2011. Since then, the relationship has been growing. We have been providing education services, software services, softwares like E-minor, courses on machine learning. And uh, this is the first time, you know, I think this uh, the end of the previous year, we talked about coming to distance learning education and start offering courses for the working professionals. And that's how it all started. And now we have full-fledged courses running with the distance learning also. So there is a program on management program in data visualization. So basically, which is six months, and it will include all the lectures, practice sessions, exam, and global certification. There are sessions on business statistics, sessions on visual analytics, and there are international certifications available from SAS. Then there is something on machine learning. So that is what we were talking today. So one of the topic was the, is there is this entry as well. So here the duration is around nine months. So you are taught business statistics. There is an analytics bridge course also taught. Then we talk about how to start your initial statistical journey using enterprise guide. And then we go into machine learning enterprise minor. Then there are a lot of case studies like financial risk management, marketing analytics operations and many other. And there is a certification also for machine learning that is available in that. The tool access is provided while you are doing the course so that you can practice, prepare, and learn more and enjoy the machine learning area. So these are some of uh, the things uh, that I think uh, I should share with you. And this program is already running with great success. The SAS part is taught by the SAS faculty along with the course material. There is something new in SAS that we call e-badges. That is what I'll quickly demonstrate. And there are a lot of other facilities facilities, which comes by the virtue of NMIS, like how the courses are delivered, how the interactions happen, how the exam patterns are flexible, how the weekend courses are managed, a lot of other benefits when SAS and NMIS come together. So that is something that is unique. And if you have any more queries further, you please feel free to either write or contact on this number. 
So this number I'll keep on displaying. Meanwhile, if you have any queries or anything, you see the chat window is there for you guys. So you can please keep on putting any queries if you have. So I'll be waiting for your queries for another couple of minutes or so. If there are no more queries, we might stop. Else, you know, feel free to type in. Please raise your queries. Yeah, so I think one of the queries that I go, got is this, is this course is going to cover only machine learning? So you see, to do machine learning, you need basics like, you know, business statistics, analytics bridge course, and from there, we will then cover the machine learning. So it's not straight away machine learning, but many other things like business statistics and analytics bridge course. Uh, but then, obviously, this course is specific to machine learning. So the whole idea is not to teach a full year PGDM kind of a thing, but then focus on the topic of machine learning. So it is machine learning and related areas is what that we are going to talk in this course. So please, please feel free to raise queries. One more thing, you know, meanwhile, you think of your queries, I'll show you. If you can search on Google something called as SAS Acclaim, it will take you to a first link called SAS Acclaim Badges. Here you have SAS certifications available. Click on any certification and just a skill set that you might have developed. And what that site does is it tells you that where are the jobs and how the openings are in six countries and what are the packages that you might get, what are the locations, who are the employers, what are the kind of packages are offered. Typically, the packages are all in the range of 8 lakhs to 20 lakhs or so. Likewise, for machine learning also, you can, you know, once you're certified, you can directly link up with the job providers. And that is one of the facilities that is available. In fact, we made it public for the benefit of all. So you can just put in your Google SAS claim and check out for the relevant jobs in the industry. And obviously, once you're certified, you are the preferred choice for the respective employers that is there. So that is something what we're calling e-badge or a SaaS badge, and that badge can be used with your social media profiles like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and many other. It is digitally verified, so it comes with a lot of other e-badge kind of an advantage that is there. So that is something I thought I would share. Meanwhile, just let me see my chat window, and if there are no more questions, I think uh, we are heading towards the closure of this particular session. So since no more questions, so let me thank you all the guys. And uh, please feel free to raise any queries, any questions to this email ID or the phone number. So please make a note of it. And once again, thanks all of you for joining me on the session. Thank you very much.